Lotus is one of the best known and most historic names in racing. People know the Lotus brand for ad lightness. They are known for either James Bond or the Elise, one of the benchmark performance cars for the last 20 years or so. The last time the Lotus brand introduced a new model, it was the Lotus Evora in 2008. And then they just kind of went away. They're out of the consciousness of most enthusiasts and certainly most car journalists. So it's significant to be in the year 2023 and to have a brand new Lotus product, which is this, the Lotus Emira. And I am astonished to be driving it. I am amazed it exists. This car is very much the old school recipe. Mid-engine, forced induction, manual transmission, and hydraulically assisted steering. The car they have pronounced their last gas-only engine. This has got to be good, right? And it's all available for under 100 grand. What's crazy is that if you think about a $100,000 mid-engine, which on one level is very expensive, but on another level is the bargain basement of cars like this, this isn't alone. There are two others. Maybe you've heard of them. I mean, you think about it, the Lotus has always been handling and chassis dynamics at all costs. The Corvette is really bang for the buck. It's always been about value, the most car you can get for the lowest price. And of course, the Porsche is going to be good at everything and it will win. Great cars, great roads, and all the reasons we love to drive. Road trips, comparisons, test drives, and podcasts. This is Everyday Driver. You can't talk about modern mid-engines without talking about the Porsche Cayman. We brought it up a lot. The Cayman and Boxster are the most docile, easily accessible mid-engines being sold. And yes, Porsches also have quite a motorsports history too. You feel it every time you drive one. I mean, how can you not be excited when you're in a Cayman? This is the GTS 4.0. The Cayman itself, even in 718 flavor, is kind of old news now, but the truth is, this is one of the best mid-engines that have ever been out there, and the fact that you can buy it in all these different price points if you go used is really amazing. All right, all right, if we're talking motorsports history, the Corvette has entered the chat. The concepts for the Corvette way back in the 60s, there were mid-engine concepts. The Corvette always wanted to be mid-engine. In spite of the fact that Chevy was talking about a possible mid-engine since the dawn of the Chevy Corvette, did we really think Chevrolet was gonna make a mid-engine car? And yet, the eighth generation, the C8 Corvette, is this mid-engine. Now, you've certainly heard about it by now, but I just cannot believe that this is what Chevrolet has done. but I wonder why it gets discounted by car enthusiasts so much. I mean, it's still got that legacy, that thing hanging over it that there's only a certain age group that should buy Corvettes and you have to drive them slowly in a certain way. I am here to remind you how good this car is. I mean, first of all, the recipe. It's a mid-engine car with a V8 in it. This is a 2021, in fact, this is the show's long-term car. This has the Z51 package, the magnetic ride, it has all of the bells and whistles. This is also one of the tighter roads where we've driven a C8, and I have to say, it's impressed me yet again. I didn't think that this big car would feel just this agile on a really tight road. Whatever you think, if you have a bad impression of the C8, oh, I don't think it's very good, you're flat out wrong. This car now does what the German sports cars have always done, that is, hide their speed and then manage it easily. But what's strange is, 
it also kind of does what the Amira does, and that is be entertaining at low speeds. There was some discussion when this first came out that it understeered badly. No, it doesn't. I, if, if you understeer the C8, it's probably because you aren't driving it like a mid-engine car. You can't drive it like a big front-engine V8 because it's not. It's possible to screw up a corner and to make this thing understeer, but most mid-engines will. It defies what people think of it. It is a much better mid-engine than, uh, honestly, even I remembered having driven it multiple times. You should also not buy a C8 Corvette without these two packages. The Z51 package, it means a little bit more power, but it means upgraded brakes and upgraded cooling and different aero and a different final drive, shorter final drive ratio. This is built with race car thinking from the beginning. The chassis, you can tell, is so stiff. This will lift a wheel over low speed bumps. It'll lift the, the off-camber wheel, but then that magnetic ride, really just irons out the bumps. It really smooths out the steering. This low, wide stance just makes this car feel stable at a level the other two cannot accomplish. This is just this hoverboard going across the world. You could run with anybody. Bring whoever you would like, and the Corvette can breathe down their neck. There's a lot of precision. There's no feel. There's a lot of precision in this wheel. And the back end rotates incredibly well, much better than a car this size should. So this is every bit as quick, every bit as capable through these same corners as the other two cars. Yes, the one with the wheelbase that is 10 inches longer than the Cayman. The Cayman rotates, but so does the Corvette, because you get that incredible suspension. Not just the double wishbone, but that magnetic ride. It does have a weight distribution that's a little bit better than the one in the Amira, not quite as good as the Cayman. This is 40% front, 60% rear. So it does still have mid-engine tendencies, and it will get the back out if you push it hard. You can go on a road trip. It's very comfortable. You set it in tour mode, and it's relaxed and happy. So are you. And then you set it in sport mode like this, and it leaves nothing on the table compared to the other two cars. Even with 3,600 pounds of weight, 400 pounds more than the other two cars. But it's so crisp and so sharp, and the car rotates so well, you're going to be amazed, and you're not going to believe it. And you're going to pick the next corner, and you're going to do it again, and you're going to be amazed again. Like, how does this car do that? Now that we have this one, we've road tripped it, we've got a lot more plans for it, and we brought it to this review. We've been very surprised by it. Every time we get out of the other two cars and into this one, we go, yeah, but the C8 is great, and it is. It's wonderful. As soon as you start driving the Amira, you know Lotus has always been the best at low and high speed steering and handling feel. The engagement. I mean, this is designed to replace the Elise and the Evora together, so it's kind of a car that combines the best qualities of both. At least that's my expectation here. The good thing is, this is a more substantial car than the Elise. I've never completely loved the Elise like Todd has. I've always felt like, well, you get amazing handling, and that's really about it. Oh, and some cool styling. Okay. But here, this is now the full package. It has that steering feel. I mean, this is now the definition and benchmark of steering feel. Electronic steering in a car helps you with things like lane keep assist and variable steering racks. This has none of that because it has an old-fashioned hydraulic steering rack. And guess what? That's just better. Lotus did it because they knew that their customers were very concerned about steering feel. That is true. Hydraulic still passes on more information than an electronic rack, even though some of the electronic ones have gotten very, very good. That chassis is absolutely astounding. Now, also with the Amira, you can choose sport suspension. This car has it. 
You can go sport or touring, and I would definitely choose the sport suspension. I think I would prefer the touring suspension. This sport suspension is pretty stiff, and because there's no adjustability, that means it's stiff all the time. You get on a less than perfect road, which is most of them, a less than perfect racetrack, which is a lot of them too, you're just, you're gonna be rattled around a lot. Now it's not bad, it's not sloppy, it's very precise, it's just a lot of movement. And those abrupt suspension movements, are, are they're just radiating back through the cabin. I think if you're gonna be a person that wants to daily this, or would drive it a lot, the touring suspension would be the way to go. There's no difference in the steering, there's no difference in the engine. You just get a little bit softer, more compliant suspension setup, and I think that would be welcome. Double wishbone suspension all around. Double wishbones are what race cars have. Double wishbones are really what you're looking for. This is what you want. Because the harder you turn in, the harder it grips. You can feel road imperfections. Now it's not distracting, it's not everything like you have in the non-assisted Elise. But you can feel the road imperfections, you can tell when the texture changes. The other two cars can't pass on this much information into the wheel, but the chassis itself is so refined that you get a lot of information everywhere else as well. The Lotus Amira is the complete opposite of a sensory deprivation chamber. I don't know what you would call that, but it gives you all of the information constantly. Oh, I'm in tour mode. I gotta change modes here. There we go. Now I'm in sport, so your toggle switch is right down here for drive mode. It doesn't actually change anything when you hit it the first time. It just wakes up the screen and says, okay, now what are we doing? That's frustrating. You should be able to hit it and instantly move it with one motion. That's not how this works. I've jumped up to sport from the touring setting, and that actually means different throttle response, a little more exhaust, and it backs off the stability control just a bit. But this Amira does not have any sort of adjustable suspension. This is an old fashioned in a wonderful way. This is a simple suspension setup which means everywhere you go, this will be a harsh ride with that sport suspension. I'm fine with that, because that's what your sports car should be. Technically, this Amira is not as well balanced as that Cayman. This is 38 front, 62 rear, so it definitely is a rear biased car. That means it can get away from you if you do something boneheaded like sudden lift off oversteer. No, it doesn't feel like a go-kart. I don't want it to feel like a go-kart. I want it to feel like this. It feels so substantial, but still so capable for either long distance, and it's just fun at all times. You feel like you sit a lot higher in the Amira than you do in the Cayman or the C8. This one feels like it has the, the highest Eye line of all three cars, which is a big surprise coming out of something like the Elise or even the Evora, because I didn't expect that the Amira would have such a high seating position. It does feel like really high and forward. It's not problematic, it's just different than I anticipated. No other car in the market has that quick turn in and the feel. I'm feeling everything, just fingertips. You will cackle. And that's what's so amazing about low tie. That is, at low speeds, suddenly you're having fun. Oh, the front end of this car. The whole car, the precision on steering is amazing. It's very crazy to go right from the Amira right into the Cayman and feel the difference because it is huge. It is a gulf. I'm fascinated because that front end feels a little bit heavier than the Amira. Actually, a lot heavier. But amazingly, this car is slightly lighter than the Amira. 3166, almost 3200, but we're just calling the Amira and the Cayman about the same weight. This is as long as the Amira, but with a shorter wheelbase. And it also has a more balanced weight distribution. This is 45 front, 55 rear, which is much more centered than either of the other two. There's every bit as much precision as the Lotus, but the steering feel has gone away. It's not even close. And you know what? This is really good. I have to drive it harder and faster 
to start to feel a little bit more character because at low speeds, it's just waiting for you to do something. Once you get going faster and faster, now you're feeling the dynamics of the car and I can just rely on everything, all this beautiful engineering. But there is something about this car that is different than the other two, the Lotus and the Corvette, and that is struts. It has to do with front end grip, and even though this is a lot, I can tell the other two cars have a bit more because of that geometry change. Don't care what the suspension is on the Cayman, it rotates so well. Granted, it has the shortest wheelbase of all of these, 97.4 inches. Of course, that's significant also because it was the wheelbase that Toyota and BMW were chasing when they made the new Z4 and Supra. Because of that strut suspension and Porsche being used to building small cars, this actually has the most room and usability of all three of these, and that's kind of amazing to me. Now, it is as long as the Amira, but the cabin in here is just airy. It's got this bubble cockpit with lots of great visibility. This is by far the easiest car to use all the time. Frunk and hatch, there's good space throughout. But weirdly, compared to these other two, it feels like the Cayman is just held back a little bit. You know Porsche has more. Well, they've proved it. There's a GT4 above this. There's just such little drama. It's just so highly capable. There's something missing. It's really good, but it doesn't have the beautiful entertainment that the Amira has. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Griot's Garage. Use the code EDRIVER for 10% off your order. This is very similar power to that supercharged Amira and about the same speed. Zero to 60 here is pretty close to four seconds, just a little bit over. But of course, that's still a second slower than the C8. You know, up to this point, I have not driven the GTS 4.0. This is my first time. I have a 2015 Cayman GTS with a 3.4, but I have not driven this car and I've always been wondering about the power. Kind of thinking this is the power my car needs. I'm right. Ooh. Listen to that. That engine. That is so special. This is the same engine that you get in a Porsche DT4, but it is detuned a little bit down to 394 horsepower, 309 pound-feet of torque, which on a car that weighs 3,200 pounds is still pretty good. But this has nice mid-range torque, has good usable power no matter what gear you're in. A lot of the times with these Porsche flat six, you have to murder it and get it way up high in the rev band to have anything usable. This is usable here at 3,000 RPM. You can get decent power out of it. They're great to shift, and I do love manuals, but there are better manuals. This doesn't feel quite like the Amira. I will say the clutch is much better on the Cayman than the Amira. The Amira is very stiff, whereas this one actually feels right. The gearbox is definitely the best of these three. Porsche knows what they're doing. A good Porsche six-speed is really hard to compete with, and this one is the best gearbox of all three. I love the GTS flavor because this is such the right balance between street and track. Yes, I would love a GT4. Yes, I would love something even more hardcore, but this is such the right balance, especially with the suspension. And it changes the character of the car. You can putter around. Instead of making the engine howl, I'll go up into, haven't even been over here, way up into sixth, out of sport mode. Now it's just car which is actually the Cayman's party trick because it doesn't require any of the normal sacrifices of a mid-engine car or even most sports cars. You can see very well, it's comfortable to be in, it can get quiet and normal. Those are things that a lot of sports cars struggle to do. In fact, both of these other two struggle to do that. You know when I said years ago that everybody should have a 500 horsepower car in their life? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. 500 horsepower in the modern time doesn't seem like an overwhelming amount of power. You're looking for something with a comma in it. I understand that, but zero to 60 in three seconds, and this is the base model. 6.2 liter V8, of course, naturally aspirated, and it sounds, well, it sounds like a big Chevy V8. 
It's 495 horsepower. That's right, a whole hundred more than everybody else playing this game. But more importantly, it does have 470 pound-feet of torque, which means it has 160 pound-feet of torque more than the other two cars. You're mostly at low RPMs all the time because there's so much torque. This car just moves so easily. And guess what? Of all three cars, the Corvette is the cheapest by more than $10,000. The MSRP, fully loaded like it is, is $81,300. The instant downside to this car is the fact that it is only offered with this eight-speed dual clutch. There is no manual transmission anymore in the Chevy Corvette. And I have two conflicting thoughts on that. First off, it doesn't restrict it being fun. This is a fantastic dual clutch transmission. It's up there with the very best ones being made. It's almost as good as the Porsche PDK, and that is essentially the standard for a good dual clutch transmission. I've become a big fan of dual clutches. After owning a PDK for a long time, it just puts its power down. It works very well, the paddles feel great, it has instant response times, and when it's in normal automatic mode, it does a pretty good job in city traffic. But it doesn't come in a manual, and I wish that it did. I wish that this car did offer that extra layer of engagement that the other two offer. <sighs> okay, here's where we are. It has a dual clutch, luckily a brilliant one. And so we deal with the fact that, oh, guess what? It's still fun. It's still very powerful. No, you don't get to shift, but you're going to be going a lot faster. The speed this can handle, it engages you in a different way and you're gonna be astonished at the capability of the C8. When you think about a zero to 60 in about three seconds, you're talking about some pretty heavyweight cars. Things like the Lamborghini Aventador jumped to mind and big Ferraris and things that cost a quarter million to $500,000. The more I drive this car, the more I think this is actually an alternative to those. That's a good sound. A Camry V6 has never sounded this good. Of all three of these, I never expected that this engine would be the one that would sound the best, but this has the most motorsport sound of all three cars. They plopped a supercharger right on top of it. It's right behind your head here. That's pretty much all you can hear. And it makes 400 horsepower, 310 pound-feet of torque. This is not a statistics car. This is not a bragging rights car. Nothing in the stat sheet of the Lotus Amir is something where somebody's gonna go, wow. You can't even brag incredibly lightweight anymore because this weighs about 3,200 pounds. It's 40 or 50 pounds heavier than that Cayman, depending upon the spec. But when I tell you it's got 400 horsepower, the Avora GT, the last model, the old one, why doesn't it have as much power as that? That one had 416 horsepower, at least in North America. But on the other hand, 400 horsepower is a lot, especially in this car. I'm not sure that it really needs more to get better. It's already great. It has a naturally aspirated feel with a crazy vacuum cleaner whooshing, slicing sound, slicing the air. The other part of the recipe is this transmission. Just the fact that Lotus offers a manual is brilliant. This gearbox is good, but it's not amazing. Now, part of the issue there is the fact that you're dealing with not only a mid-engine car, but a transversely mounted mid-engine, and that's a much harder to get gearbox refinement. Now, it's not bad. It's the same ball shifter and linkage that there's been in the Lotus for a long time. In fact, you can even see it work in here, which is kind of a, a fun little Easter egg. Don't do that while you drive. This does not have rev match, so I was wondering, and when you brake, with half your foot. If you're wearing the right shoe, the other half of the throttle pedal is right there. It's brilliant. I thought about this. This is the pure kind of driving experience. Pedals are very close together. In fact, this is a car that requires me to wear some pretty narrow shoes. However, there's a really good dead pedal and this has a very comfortable driving position. Sorry, I stopped talking there for a minute because I'm just enjoying myself. Sub 3,000 pound cars are certainly ideal, but this is not bad. 3,000 to 3,200 is the sweet spot for sports cars. 
It's just so entertaining. More of the knives! Let the knives slice everything! I kind of wish I had a bottomless gas tank and a road that never ended. Because if you're a car enthusiast, you will appreciate this car so much. This Amira and the Evora do share the same chassis, the same bone structure. The wheelbase is the same. The skeleton, if you will, is identical on both cars. The drivetrain with this Camry supercharged V6 and this six-speed is the same as it was in the Evora. So this isn't a revolutionary change. This isn't something where they started over, but they have refined it really well. This is actually sensual. It's interesting. The surfaces really play nicely together, but it's also so aggressive, but still very graceful. This is the same length as the Cayman, but somehow looks far longer and more sensual. And those cutout shapes just behind the headlights right there, I like that, that's unique. It actually just says flat hood, and then with that cutout, it lets the fender swell kind of out of this shape. I didn't like the snake nostrils, and from the three-quarter angle, one of my favorite angles on most cars, I didn't like looking into that nostril. Seeing it in person, I've warmed to it. It's still my least favorite part of the styling, but in general, this is an incredible looking car. I do wish the paint color were different because this dark green verdant is too much black in it. It should be brighter and more saturated, but a different color on this makes this look like a supercar, double the price, at least. This has a totally different interior design than you had in the Evora. Everything is improved. It's now no gauges at all. There's an LCD screen in front of you. There's another really nice touch screen here. The controls, the screen, the overall layout, it's nice enough, but it doesn't really say this is a high-end exotic. Lotus has just done enough to satisfy somebody who realizes they're paying almost $100,000. This one's 94, but of course the prices have gone up. So we'll call it 100 grand. And they want something luxurious enough, but that isn't the point. They have let all that fall away. The seats are good, but I'm waiting for an upgrade. I suspect at some point Lotus is gonna offer a more aggressive seat than these, and I would welcome that. The bolsters just don't hold you quite tight enough. But maybe we're waiting for some Emira GT flavor, but you'll notice. The steering wheel and the shifter, this is the point. This is high and airy and the door sill feels really low. The visibility is good all around. The Cayman has slightly better visibility than this, but by a fraction. The steering wheel, flat bottom, yes. Well, actually kind of a flat top too. It's just the right size. That's so you can see your gauges properly. It has a series of buttons on the steering wheel, all of which are actual buttons. They're not haptic. They've got just enough movement for you to tell what's going on. But the HVAC controls could be straight out of any economy car. Same thing for the drive mode switch, the volume knob, the cup holders, everything else. Look at the switch gear here. Straight from Volvo. This interface is incredibly stark and simple, but also great. The only issue here is that sometimes it's slower than it should be. The only real slow poke is the drive mode button. The rest of the screen is mostly okay. It's not the fastest one you're gonna find, but I love how readable it is. It's very easy to work with. I, I dare say it has kind of a first gen Apple iPad feel about it. And in the world of cars, that's pretty great. And then you come to this red covered start stop button right here. It's the claw hanging over the start stop button, right? That makes every time you start and stop the car an event because you have to lift this thing out of the way this i'm blocking you from the fun and people are somehow confused by this i mean okay you can go in with your pinky and you can start it but it's really easy you just you just lay your hand on the center console thumb underneath the button you know i didn't really like the corvette when it came out when it was first introduced, I thought it was too busy. And I've changed my mind because it looks exotic. Even though it costs more, the Cayman should look more exotic than this. It should look like the $100,000 price point. This is way under that. And it look, it turns my head every time. Of course, much has been said about the back end, which is way too big and way too wide, but entirely because they wanted to accomplish one, not one, but two sets of golf clubs in the rear, a, a much more sensual, soft, rear end of this car would have made this car look a lot better overall. 
And then you get into the interior, where it's pure emotion. By far the most interesting interior of all three cars. You feel like you're in a sports car. There's an experience to be had. And you're in this cocoon with this driver separation here, wall of Gibraltar in the middle. Now, that seems really daunting when you see it on camera or you hear people talk about it. The truth is, both driver and passenger tend to really like it. And it, it's very ergonomic. It makes all kinds of sense as to how to use the HVAC controls all the way up to heated and cooled seats. This is a loaded car. And even though $81,300 is still a lot of money, it's less and I get more. This has far more content than either of those cars and a lot more power. Meanwhile, it has stats that are almost closer to the cars above these. But what I love the most is how much space there is for the driver here, and the position is very comfortable. The base seats are great. You're not quite as over the front wheels as you are in the other two cars, but you feel very far forward, but yet there's plenty of space for your feet. It doesn't have a lot of space though. This is a big car with double wishbones up front and in the rear, and this massive engine. They've had to cramp the cabin a bit. The visibility in this car is not great. It's okay out front, even though it's all very letterboxed. The rear is very difficult. Thankfully, you do have a digital rear view mirror, which is a godsend. And I have never used a backup camera and a nose camera system more than I do in the Corvette C8. The Cayman is like a really hot girl wearing a bathing suit and cap from the 1920s. The Cayman has become too modest in its, in its execution. A voluptuousness is something that comes to mind. Voluptuous, that word. Entertain my senses, gratify my imagination. I feel like Cayman has gotten away from that. The lines are too severe. They're actually almost too Volkswagen-like in the front end. They're, they're too severe. There's not enough sensual, beautiful, full surfaces. And unless it has a giant wing in the back, nobody looks at this car. And then of course in the interior, it's very clean and simple. It's been this way for uh, decades now. In spite of being the GTS 4.0, which is kind of high in the Cayman hierarchy, this is a pretty low tech car in here. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't exist. I mean, these seats are about as basic as they can be. There's a lot of blank buttons here of options that aren't available. The screen doesn't need to be huge. I do like the vents, but this shape doesn't work quite as well. I even like the steering wheel updates. I really like the wheel, the size, the placement. The seats feel great, and they're not even the upgraded seats. These are just excellent. The driver's position is brilliant. Tech can overwhelm a car like this, and this is really very focused and nice. However, you spent a hundred grand, and both of the other cars here have got more content in them and aren't any more expensive. It's also close between these three cars. When you consider that most everything else like this is a quarter million and way, way up, this is the bargain part of this market. And I'm amazed there's three cars in it. I need you to understand that all of these cars are excellent. They're just different. I feel at home in the Cayman. Every time I get in a Cayman, this is home. This is home base. I want the Cayman, but it does not have the entertainment factor the other two cars have. I like the Cayman. It is my favorite of the Porsche products. I like it more than the 911 in pretty much any flavor. I know now some of you are rage typing, but I like mid-engine cars, I like small cars, and so the Cayman has always spoken to me. I don't know that it's that special anymore. I, I hate to say that because it's really very good and we've recommended it many times on camera and on our podcast. And of all three of these cars, this is the best. But it's not the one I wanna be in. It's not the most entertaining. You know what, it's not the most fun. As much as I love it, as much a Cayman guy and a Porsche guy I am, this is my third place car. Can you believe that? I can't either. When you drive a Cayman, especially against these other two, you're just struck by the fact that Porsche did it all right. That everything about this feels very satisfying to drive. It feels very precise. This was built by PhDs in lab coats. It just has that feel about it. 
In the end though, this doesn't feel as unique or special as the other two cars. And while it speaks to me more than the C8 does, the Lotus speaks to me more. After admitting to you that the Porsche was number three, I'm having trouble showing my face. But you cannot deny the drama, the theater, the engagement, the character that these other two cars have. What the average person thinks about when they think about a supercar driving experience is realized here in the C8 Corvette. It has the low wide stance, the little bit difficult visibility, but it has a really mean look, a great sounding engine. Have you seen how crazy the styling is? That's not really stuff that applies to the other two that we brought, but all of it applies here. I don't have to concede anything driving the C8. If you loaded up a Cayman to what a C8 is, you'd be paying well over a hundred grand. Chevrolet has not just made a mid-engine car. They've not just made a new Corvette. They've made one of the most versatile, usable sports cars being offered at any price. If you've even like toyed with the possible idea of maybe one day looking at the C8, you're, you're holding yourself back. You should go drive one because if you like this at all, I bet you it's better than you think. Corvette, because of what it can do and how comfortable you are, and you keep coming back to the price and the styling, how interesting this car is. Every time I get in, I'm surprised again how good it is. The reason this doesn't do better in this group for me is just because I like small, light cars with a manual transmission, and both of those do that. Also, they are smaller, lighter cars with more room for me, and I'm a big guy. I'm not comfortable in all cars, and those cars pull it off. Of all the cars, I, I want something that is just going to surprise me and make me pay attention at all times. It's the newest old car I've ever felt. It's the oldest new car I've ever driven. It's got that old school recipe, but it feels new and fresh. If the Porsche was set up by PhDs in lab coats, this was set up by Doc Brown on a bender. This lacks some of the refinement in the gearbox and some of the way that this feels. It feels a little more frantic and not as well refined, but that's endearing to me. And I admit, I have not loved Lotus like Todd has loved that company and loved what they produce. This car I love. This is spectacular. The Amira is like this greatest hits love letter to stuff manufacturers no work. Hydraulic steering, it's here. Non-adjustable suspension, it's here. An actual limited slip differential, not some e-diff, that's here too. Stuff that is tried and true and works well on many beloved cars is being sold brand new in the Lotus Amira. What makes this car special and worthwhile is the culmination of all of these kinds of parts and setup you just don't get anymore. This is the best of how cars can be still being sold as a new car right now. I choose the Lotus first. It's, of all these cars, this is the one I want to get in. I just want to spend more time with it to explore its depths because it's not handing you anything. It will not do anything for you. Everything is on you in this car. There is nothing about it that will save you. And that's what's so intoxicating about it. The interactions, the physical nature of this car is what brings it to life. How did they merge what I love about my Elise with a larger car? This weighs 50% more than my Elise. It doesn't feel like it. The other two are so impressive. This is the car for me. I don't think this is the car for everybody. I still think this is, this Amira is still very much an alt. It's very much the unique car for the right buyer. It's not for anybody looking for a sports car. It's a little too raw for that, but I just love it. Somehow they have done a bigger Elise. I want it very badly.